Hello, in this lecture we will look in detail at the structure of the cell membrane and one of its most important functions and that is permeability. So you have a reading assignment in chapter 3 sections 2 and 3 and two study guide questions number 14 and 15 that will help you focus as you read and listen to this lecture. Before we get started let's just look at the little cartoon on the bottom. It illustrates this role of permeability that the cell membrane has. And what that means is it controls what substances can enter or exit the cell. So the nutrient wants to get in and the cell membrane says you may enter. Other functions of a cell's membrane include an obvious one and that is um, that it defines the boundary of a cell which to some extent gives it a shape and size. However, there's two other functions that aren't quite as obvious unless you've had cell biology. One of them is related to how cells communicate with each other or interact with each other. The membrane could directly communicate with another cell through something called direct contact, which just means that they lie next to each other and touch or the cell membrane can communicate with chemicals. Chemical communication is called cell signaling and it involves one cell releasing a chemical compound that binds to a receptor on another cell's membrane. And then the last function of the cell membrane relates to its proteins. The proteins within a cell membrane have a variety of functions. There are so many different types of proteins within a cell membrane and they do different things. The cell shown on this slide has six membrane proteins, one purple one, two blue, two green, and one red. Now because membrane permeability is so essential to the function of the whole cell, we need to understand what kinds of molecules can cross the cell membrane and which kinds can't because that will impact cell function. But to understand what can cross, we need to look at the, the chemical structure of the cell membrane first. And some of this is review. The cell membrane is largely made up of lipids, in fact 98%, and 2% of the membrane is made up of protein. These proteins are inserted into the lipid matrix or the lip phospholipid bilayer. And we call these proteins transmembrane proteins because they span the width of the membrane. Now there's different types of lipids. I alluded to one type, the phospholipid bilayer to start with. The phospholipids um, in this diagram have blue balls and just straight lines for the tails. Some of them have carbohydrate added to them. Those are the purple um, structures on top of the blue balls. And <clears throat> Cholesterol can be seen in the phospholipid bilayer as well. This picture has different color scheme but the same idea. The tails of the phospholipid bilayer are shown in yellow and the polar heads are more white. The purple structures are transmembrane proteins and the cholesterol is shown in blue. So this structure of a cell membrane is often described as a fluid mosaic. This term mosaic refers to the fact that there's different types of compounds and molecules present. The term fluid refers to the fact that the lipids and proteins can move and change position within the membrane. So the aspect of being fluid relates not only to the fact that 
um, things can move, but it also can change. The fluidity can change. And fluidity is influenced, <clears throat> excuse me, by temperature, pH, um, how much cholesterol is present in the phospholipid bilayer, and the degree to which the fatty acids are saturated with hydrogen. So the membrane is dynamic, it changes. And this feature was discovered during an experiment in which researchers took two cells, a mouse cell and a human cell, and labeled them and then fused them together to look at how the proteins, because that was something they could label, changed their position over time. So first a mouse cell was stained with a blue fluorescent dye and that stain adhered to just the proteins. And then a human cell's proteins were labeled with a red fluorescent dye. Now the two cells were fused together by adding a spark of electrical current. And then the researchers put the cell in the incubator and watched, pulled it out and watched it over time under the microscope. And what they noticed was that the blue and red proteins relocated and were distributed evenly all over the fused membrane or fused cells membrane. If the proteins hadn't been able to move within the phospholipid bilayer, you would expect the blue proteins to be on one end and the red proteins to be on the other end of this bigger cell. Okay, so let's begin talking about cell membranes function uh, in permeability <clears throat> by reviewing the molecules in the membrane. So recall that these phospholipids that form a bilayer are made up of polar heads and nonpolar tails. The heads are polar, shown with the blue ball, because the fatty acid has a phosphate group and it has a um, uh, nitrogen, and that makes it polar. So the phospholipids are nonpolar. Oh, sorry. Gosh. I'm going to restate that. So the phospholipid heads are polar. And that would be the blue balls. I'm so sorry. The two fatty acid tails are nonpolar. And that's because they don't have that phosphate group. They don't have the nitrogen. Now the proteins, because they are proteins and made up of amino acids, they are polar. So a cell's permeability which means the ease with which an ion or a molecule can penetrate and cross is dependent on this polarity and nonpolarity. Generally speaking, the phospholipid bilayer is considered to be overall nonpolar because the fatty acid tails are so thick forming this bilayer that they play the biggest role. So the phospholipid bilayer is nonpolar and hydrophobic, the interior of the membrane. That means that substances that are small, nonpolar, and also hydrophobic can cross. But substances that are polar cannot get across this phospholipid bilayer. That is not possible. Can't do that. But fortunately the transmembrane proteins are there. And these transmembrane proteins, which are polar, form channels and carriers. They're hydrophilic because they're polar and they allow the passage of small polar molecules that are also hydrophilic. Now the proteins are specific for certain molecules. So one protein, for example, might allow sodium to go across. And another one might allow glucose to go across. 
So it really depends on the protein's amino acid sequence. That's what determines what can go through. Here's a picture of a couple of channel types or transmembrane protein types. And the one on the left is the one that we're going to be talking about um, in this unit. It's called a membrane channel. And it links the extracellular environment with the intracellular cytoplasm. And it forms this kind of pore-like structure. Depending on what amino acids are present here, it'll only allow a certain substance to go in. And I'm going to pretend that this one happens to be a sodium ion channel. It couldn't be also a different ion channel. It can only allow one type through. Here is an example on the right of how two cells are lined up perfectly so that their transmembrane proteins that form channels, here's one, a blue one, and an orange one, are lined up so that material can pass between the cytoplasm of one cell and the cytoplasm of another cell. So that's called a gap junction, and that will become important when we talk about cardiac muscle. Now, membrane proteins have other functions. They adhere to an extracellular matrix that keeps the cell in position relative to other cells and tissues. The membrane proteins also connect cells with other cells to form tissues. And we've already talked a little bit about the fact that the membrane will communicate with its external environment, and it's really the membrane proteins that do that. Fourth, some membrane proteins perform chemical reactions, and lastly, some membrane proteins actually mark a cell as a specific type or self cells versus foreign cells. So we're going to look at those examples next. So here is an example of the cell membrane protein interacting with the extracellular matrix to keep a cell in position. The membrane protein is labeled with the arrow, and it's blue. And it notice that it is adhered to some collagen fibers, and another one is adhered to some elastin fibers. Those are outside the cell and kind of form a network to keep cells in position within tissues. This is an example of how membrane proteins form tissues by adhering to other cells. There's there's many ways they do this, but I'm going to focus on two, tight junctions and something called desmosomes. So tight junctions are kind of what they sound like. Um, they don't allow material to pass between cells, so nothing can get through there. So I should erase that. Nothing can get through the two cells, and that's because the phospholipid bilayer, and it would be shown here, the phospholipid bilayers of the two cells are touching and reinforced with transmembrane proteins. This is particularly important in um, areas of the body where you don't want substances to leak out of an organ. Think of the stomach acid. You wouldn't want that to leak out. And then there are um, membrane proteins involved in something called desmosomes. Now, contrary to what you may think because of the word tight junctions, desmosomes are the strongest, okay? They have so many different proteins associated with the linkage between two cells that it, it makes the two cells stick together with a great deal of force. So there's some yellow ones, there's a purple one, there's another purple one, and there's some red ones. So um, desmosomes are really strong. And that's important in cardiac muscle that's going to beat. It's going to contract and beat and move your entire life. It's also important for your skin um, because we don't want skin to tear apart, of course.
so much friction that we encounter. Okay, this is an example of um, how membrane proteins communicate with other cells. They can communicate directly, just kind of like the gap junction we saw, but it doesn't have to allow substances to go across. But here's the transmembrane protein of one cell, and here's the transmembrane protein of another cell. The fact that they bind links the two cells. That's one way. It's called direct contact. Another way membrane proteins are involved in communication is through um, chemical signaling. And what they do is they receive a chemical signal. So our cell cytoplasm is beige down here. And the membrane protein is blue. It can bind to a chemical signal, which causes a reaction inside the cell. So we call this membrane protein a receptor. But we'll have a whole section on that, so you don't have to worry too much right now that it's called a receptor. Another uh, function of membrane proteins deals with the fact that some proteins are enzymes. And so even though they're embedded on a membrane or in a membrane, they can still perform um, or catalyze a chemical reaction. So in this example, the one on the picture on the left, I have a reaction happening in the extracellular environment. The reactant will bind to this membrane protein, which is an enzyme, and a product will be formed. But that could just as easily happen intracellularly. So this time, within the cytoplasm is the reactant, and it gets turned into a product. So membrane proteins can be enzymes, just like any protein. OK, and the last function of membrane proteins has to do with identity. Now, most of the time, the proteins that deal with identity on a cell surface are glycosylated. They have this carbohydrate attached to them. Some examples that you're probably familiar with are blood types. You've probably heard of A type, B, O, A, B. So that would mean that these proteins, or at least glycoproteins, are unique for each blood type, and that's true. <clears throat> In addition, your blood has different proteins than, say, your liver cells. So that gives the cell its identity as far as tissue type and organ type. But all of your cells in your body have some proteins that are unique just to you. They're called MHC proteins, and they're found in all of your cells, and they help um, make sure that your immune system only fights foreign cells, not your own cells. So that's all for membrane structure and permeability. Thank you.